is my honor to welcome everyone here. And it is my honor also on behalf of Google to welcome the Catalyst Network Foundation for their third annual STEM Career Day. One of the reasons we're so excited to host this event every year is that it gives an opportunity for the entire community to come together and see what are new opportunities within STEM and what are different careers that can lead them to uh, being technologists or people that are associated with the technology field. We're here showcasing what technology can do and, and be for these students. It, it was great watching these students get excited about the technology we're talking about and trying to figure out what their career looks like. We're excited to be a part of today. We're excited to talk to the students, to basically guide them on their path. I wish this program was around when I was in high school. And it is an HBCU that is making waves in STEM fields. We have over 100 majors and concentrations and over eight professional schools. I think STEM is the future and it's important for students to realize that having skills in coding, um, science, mathematics, it's very valuable to future employers. We are happy to partner with the Catalyst Network here to assist with the STEM youth program, telling the students what we have to offer at New York Presbyterian Hospital and how their education will relate to their future career. It's a great place to be a STEM student. I think it's really important to focus on those areas and get practical knowledge and experience. We came to the youth STEM event with uh, some kids in our law major uh, who are doing really wonderful things. They're learning about some aspects of tech law uh, with some attorneys from a really great firm. We've been playing around with all the cool STEM stuff here and uh, it's been a great experience uh, that I hope will pay off in some long-term connections for our kids. What we try to do is instill in them an understanding that STEM is much more than uh, being at a, uh, uh, at a lab bench or uh, at a computer screen. And we're delighted to be able to hopefully make a contribution to the, uh, the lives of these kids. What keeps me coming back is that spark that we see in the youth. You know, there's such an incredible opportunity to go into underserved communities that may not have the opportunities to learn about computer science or STEM careers and bring them here so they get that exposure. You know, I hear things like uh, teachers and, and, and school administrators talking about, wow, we love this event because we're under-resourced and this allows us to expose our students to all of the future careers in technology. I hear things from students who say, wow, I never thought I could be an engineer, or I never thought that STEM was something for me. But not only do they see it in their future, they see people on the stage, on the panel, that resemble them. They can see themselves in the panelists, and they can see a future and a path going forward. As they go from the high school space to college, I think this is a great opportunity for them to find internships, mentorships, as well as you know, job opportunities. We had some of the best and brightest from schools across New York, uh, as well as organizations both inside as well as outside the STEM career fields to really expose our next generation to what are the opportunities that are available to them. So whether it is going through the traditional software engineering role path or something that is less traditional as how does the law impact the way that we view technology. These were all opportunities that were brought here today to over 200 students. So again, on behalf of Google, it was an honor to host the Catalyst Network Foundation, and it is an honor to play a role in this community in shaping the next generation of technologists. Thank you, Google. I wanna thank all our stakeholders for making this event what it was today. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Priester. I serve as the Global Community Inclusion Lead here at Google. Uh, in that capacity, work with our global team to help build community, help do programming like this uh, that's engaged to make sure that Google not only cultivates the next generation of diverse technologists, but make sure that we as a company are accountable to you all as a community and that we have a place in a dialogue with the next generation as well as uh, our users who each and every one of you serve as a user that helps cultivate a great set of products that we have here. So 
it is our honor to work in partnership with the Catalyst Network Foundation. And uh, you all, they are our host. We are hosting the Catalyst Network Foundation. This is the third year running that we've been hosting this program, and we're super excited to have each and every one of you all here. Is this is always one of the highlights. Uh, this is also a great time that we have amazing partners from around New York City, from around the tech industry, and from education and different industries here today to serve you, to talk to you about different career paths, to talk to you about how you can can, as people who are in high school, you can start the work now to begin your career. So without further ado, it's my honor to bring up to the stage Laurel. He is the founder and CEO of the Catalyst Network Foundation. Let's give him a round of applause. How are you all doing? Good morning. Got a bear with me. I just came in town, I guess technically like in the AM from... Um, Durham, North Carolina. So I go to grad school at Duke University. So I just literally came to town. So I'm a little bit fatigued. But um, I just want to make sure the schools that we have in the building are Brooklyn Tech. Is it? OK, a little bit quiet. OK. Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice. OK. <laughs> and Midwood. Definitely. So I'll just give a brief overview of the Catalyst Network Foundation, the importance of this event, and then a little bit of background myself. So the Catalyst Network Foundation, we're a youth STEM, youth professional development program. So our goal is to develop the hard, soft, and practical skills of our high school youth, which are you guys. And the way we do that is each year we have a cohort of about 20 to 25 individuals that we select in New York City and Washington, D.C., and that cohort, they go through our three-week summer intensive program that occurs at St. Francis College in downtown Brooklyn. So during those three weeks, from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., there'll be soft skill workshops, so public speaking, networking skills, resourcefulness skills. Um, you'll go on corporate tours. Funny enough, our first corporate tour that we went on was 2012. It was actually at Google. Um, so Google, I, we appreciate that love right there. But you'll go to other corporations like Covington and Burling. And funny enough about Covington and Burling, our first corporate tour in Washington, D.C. was at Covington and Burling's Washington, D.C. office. So a lot of these corporations that, and we did our first, and I'm going to mention this, our community-based project presentation was at Microsoft's office. But with the corporate tours, you know, been to Microsoft on three occasions, I think Google on three occasions, Covington and Burling, if you count Washington, D.C. and New York City, I think maybe five. Um, you'll go to other corporations as well, Goldman Sachs, BET, Essence, you name it, just to pretty much broaden the horizon and see how these corporations um, connect with their personnel and understand the different divisions. You'll actually work on a community-based project, and it can be a project to your liking. So I remember one time it was actually Mega Everest College Preparatory School we partnered with. They wanted to raise 80000 for an audio room at the school. Another school who we deal with is uh, Benjamin Banneker Academy. They wanted to do, raise uh, 20000 for a Northeast College tour. And then Washington, D.C. School Without Walls, they actually partnered with NPR to do their own version of TED Talks. So at these community-based projects, what we do is we provide you guys with the ability to either raise capital for your initiative or get strategic resources. And you present in front of personnel at corporations to convince them to be a part of that venture. Aside from that, we have a mentorship program, and then we do our best. We have different workshops throughout the year, and then we do our best with the colleges that we partner with to get you guys in there. So, I mean, we partner with a lot of schools that you see here. So we've had alumni that went to Yale, that have gone to Howard, that have gone to Spelman, that have gone to NYU, Columbia, John Hopkins. I mean, you pretty much, uh, you name it, and they've went to those schools. Um, and then aside from that, what we try to do with this Youth STEM event is pretty much connect all the dots. So we call this the Youth STEM Pipeline, and we wanted all the stakeholders that we feel are essential to the pipeline. So right now, we pretty much have any college that could fit your liking, from community college to HBCUs to Ivy Leagues and to strong regional colleges here. So if you're thinking about going the college route, you have an inroads to one of those schools. And then aside from that, we have STEM organizations and nonprofits such as American Need You, where if you're thinking about going to SUNY and CUNY, you should definitely look up that organization. They provide a plethora of resources and guidance. And then there's Digital Girls Code, there's Black Girls Code, and a host of others, and they provide free resources. So then once you, you can have these free resources while you're in high school, and then you have the inroads to many of these colleges, and then aside from that, we have these corporations here. And as you guys know, Google and Microsoft, Covington and Burling, and New York Presbyterian, they're very, as you get older, you'll realize, especially in college, 
is very competitive and difficult to get into. So what better way, while you're here, to build rapport with some of the personnel here and then see what it takes to position yourself to be strong candidates when you're sophomores and juniors in college to potentially get an internship and potentially work for the school full time so you can have that advantage amongst some of your counterparts that when they're in college, they may just be connecting with them as sophomores and juniors in college and you're having that ability here in high school. Um, and then aside from that, just to give a brief overview of myself, from Washington DC, born and raised, lived in New York City the past 10 years, worked in investment banking and private equity, like I said, started, Catus Network, one of the founding members, Monica Myers, actually works here in Google, um, go to grad school at Duke University, sort of Fuqua School of Business, get my MBA, actually have a startup that I started not too long ago, hopefully be on the level of Google and Microsoft <laughs> in the future. But um, I'll, that's pretty much enough from me. But I just want you guys to soak everything all in here and definitely leverage the, the access that you guys have today, you know, and propel that. So I want to bring, without further ado, bring the panel moderator, Bert Jarvis. Bert, where you at, bro? All right, another round of applause for Laurel, CNF, Google, all of our partners here today. <clears throat> Show of hands, how many people don't know why they came here today? Just showed up, I got a day off of school, not really sure why I'm here. I'm in 11th grade, I get to leave the building. Okay, appreciate the honesty. Uh, show of hands, how many people would like to leave here with at least one idea that's just so valuable, you come back and you're just gonna level up, you know, compared to your peers. Anybody just wanna leave with just one thing that you can level up? Okay, great, awesome. So, show of hands, how many people won't raise their hand no matter what question I ask? I appreciate that, I appreciate that. There's a real crowd. So, my name is Bert, you know, welcome to our Youth STEM event. And our job today is to expose you to the careers of the future and to the different ways in which you can achieve that, to have you connect with uh, folks, mentors who are using technology in their everyday lives, whether they're coding or tech is part of what their company impacts, right? So before we start that, I wanna make sure everybody is just kinda in the right frame of mind. So everyone do me a favor, I want you to turn to the person to your left or right, depending on where you're sitting, give them a high five and say, this is gonna be awesome. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah. Now, now what I want you to do, I want you to take your hand, I want you to put it on the shoulder of the person next to you. Okay. I want you to, I want you to look that person in the eye, not in a creepy way. <laughs> not in a creepy way. All right. I want you to say, person, what's your number? No, no, don't say that. That's not the real, that's not the real, <laughs> that's not the real exercise. Some of y'all were like, am I falling in love? No, no. Uh, I want you to take your hand. I want you to put it on the person. That, this is the real activity. Say person. Times have changed. People have changed. Seasons have changed. But one thing will never change. <laughs> I will always look better than you. Now, now, come, come on, guys. <laughs> There's a confident crowd. So, before I kick off the panel, um, quick question: Does anybody here can just what what is coding? If you hear coding, like what does that mean to you? Just put it in everyday language. You know what? Let's do it one better. I'm gonna show you coding, all right? So we're gonna actually program a human to do something, right? But we're gonna do it in two steps. So uh, I need a volunteer human. Okay, I need a human man or human woman to, yes, you raised your hand first. It's okay, don't second guess it, don't doubt yourself. Okay, okay, it's okay. All right, uh, I need, uh, no, one is fine, cool. So now, what's your name? Okay, Amelia. It's all right, Amelia. We're here with you. We're gonna program. We're gonna program Amelia to uh, do something. So you're gonna give her two instructions, and you're gonna tell her what you know. Give her two instructions, and if she successfully does those instructions, she is going to get a prize from me. I have a prize in my pocket. I'm gonna give Amelia a prize. Okay. So what should? How should Amelia earn this? Actually, you know what? Jeez. Uh, okay. Cool. So hold on a second. Let's just. All right. I'm feeling inspired. 
How should Amelia earn this? Uh, so, you know, you can, you can say she should clap two times. She could do a quick dance. Raise your hand. What do you think she should do to earn? Yes. The disco, then run around in circles? What is the disco? Oh, just this? Okay. And then, and then, and then what? Okay. So the disco, and then run around, maybe turn around, because I don't, yeah, safety first, all right? So disco, and run around, but here's the question. What does she do first? Ah, huh? You didn't, but you didn't, you didn't, you said that, but you didn't say do this first. So if she turned around and did a disco, we wouldn't know if it, it, it wouldn't read. So the same way a computer wouldn't read if you didn't tell it what order to do the dance, we got to do the same thing when programming a human, right? So what's she doing first? Okay, so what's your name? Alexa, you're a programmer. Now here's the thing, we're gonna add an event to it. An event is something that the computer waits for something to happen to then take the action. So for example, an event in your life could be, as soon as Bay texts me something crazy, I'm gonna respond with a crazy, like, you know, angry emoji, right? <laughs> like, your friend look better than you, what? <laughs> right, but every time that happened, it triggers you, right? So the event is something that triggers you, right? Remy, you with me? Okay, cool. So, so the, the event is going to be when you guys clap, she will perform the action, okay? All right. So when you guys clap, I'm sorry, when you guys clap three times. So go ahead. Awesome, round of applause. Here you go. Oh, wait, 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 here you go. All right, wait, wait, time out, time out. The reason I gave you two, my only instruction for you is you have to spend that by the end of the day, but you have to spend that on someone other than yourself. Do you agree to my conditions? I agree. <laughs> Alexa, please look up how to get $10. <laughs> I had to do the joke. All right, round of applause, guys. Okay. So we're about to bring up the panelists, but first, really quickly, can I have uh, the representatives from Urban Assembly stand up, and the representatives from Midwood, and the representative from Brooklyn. Y'all came with chaperones, right? Y'all didn't just roll up. <laughs> Y'all rolled up in here like gang gang, like <laughs> no chaperone. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions, um, and then we're going to bring up the panel. So. All right. Okay, no, 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 you guys don't have to. By the way, guys, really quickly, um, uh, before I ask these questions, we just wrote some code. What was the event that made Alyssa take action? Okay, cool, what were the commands? Disco, what was the other one? What was the sequence? Yeah, there's also one thing called a forever loop, so if you would've added that, she would've had to be doing it like forever. Like, we would've been at the end of the event, but, I, I didn't want to get too, much, too far ahead of it. So check this out. So what I want to know from you guys is if you could just say your name um, and then how are you guys incorporating STEM in your school currently? I teach law. You teach law. Okay, have you observed? Uh, uh, Mr. Turner, you want to you wanna come up here and say, I mean, we, we have, we, we got lots of STEM. We get, STEM all the way, but who cares? Because we got the law kids here and they're better, so that's fine. <laughs> this, is, this just got real Game of Thrones. It was like, feed him to the dragons. All right, all right, here you go. Hello, I'm Miss Lakavala to my students. I'm the director of the college office. Um, the way we're incorporating STEM is by partnering with places like Catalyst, because we're more of a humanities-focused school. So we partner with a lot of, lot of outside organizations, because we don't have as many STEM, folk, STEM classes in our building. What school is this? The Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice. Awesome, very cool. And then, yes? Hi. Uh, I'm Mr. Peterson from uh, Midwood High School. I'm assistant principal there. And uh, we incorporate STEM. We've uh, grown our computer science program by adding computer science A, AP classes, 
Um, we also just this year introduced a 3D printing class as well as a t-shirt screen printing class. We have, ha, so, computer science. So we've uh, trying to build our program because uh, STEM is the future. Awesome, and then, so, so we have panelists that are about to come up really quick. We have panelists that are about to come up, but what I'm curious from you is, how would you like, because you, you, know, you talked about partnering organizations, how would you like to work with some of the corporate sponsors and some of the organizations? How, in what way could you work with them that would benefit what you're trying to do and when your programs with STEM? How could they support you? How would you like to see that partnership evolve? Um, I mean, for me personally, I would love to see more events like this, having students get real hands-on experience, uh, seeing where people use this in their everyday lives. I think that would be a, a great experience for these students. Awesome. And speaking of hands-on, everyone here is a coder. You just wrote your first program. Somebody got 10 bucks off it. Uh, some of y'all salty. But you all just wrote your first program. Uh, whether it's STEM, or I know Covington and Burling is here, a place that never wanted to hire me as a lawyer. Uh, so it's just true. Uh, anyway, uh, these kids will, will do whatever you want, and they'll do it well. So. Yeah, you know, listen. It just got it just got real. It just we went from like an eight to an eleven. <laughs> I think paid internships because money moves, money talks. I think that's something that's important. Cardi B reference, yeah. Um, so yeah, paid internships over the summer for sure. Okay. So internship to support the pen type. All right, please give them a round of applause. Uh, not permanently but if you want to throw it back to me. So now we're going to very quickly bring up the panelists. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, if we can have the panelists come up, we're going to begin our panel. And let me explain how the panel is going to work. We are going to have, I have a few questions that the panelists know I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask some of those. And when each panelist comes up, they're going to say their name, a little bit about what they do, and then uh, they're going to end that 60-second kind of uh, explanation with uh, how them or their company changes the world. After that, we'll do a couple questions, and then I'll open up for Q&A. Is everybody okay with those instructions? Yeah. All right, fantastic. No shade. Um, so I'm an attorney at Covington and Burling. I um, practice in their technology transactions group, um, helping sort of tech companies and our clients who want to engage the services of tech companies um, you know, get together to collaborate, uh, offer services, develop technology, develop platforms, et cetera. Um, the way that our, my company sort of changes the world, I, I guess, you know, partially in that way. So we have a lot of our clients who want to do um, really interesting things that um, push the boundaries, and they need sort of guidance on how to get around the legal hurdles that are associated with that. Um, so we do that work on a day in and day in, day out basis. We also do a lot of pro bono work that I, yeah, advocating on behalf of clients who um, couldn't otherwise afford our, uh, our legal services. Awesome, thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Gay Clark. I am a diversity manager here at Google. Um, prior to coming to Google, I was a software engineer and director in technology. Um, a lot of my work here at Google is thinking about how do I get more um, underrepresented youth on the path to becoming a software engineer as well. Um, and so how my company is changing the world, I think you guys know about Google and all the amazing things that we're doing. Um, we are in every area of emerging technology, just to being innovative and creating and building. And so, and you guys are here. All right, good morning. Good morning. I said good morning. There we go. My name is Jerome Joseph. Uh, I'm an alum of Howard University. Shout out to Beyonce for dropping that album and video Netflix documentary yesterday. Um, I'm also a native of Houston, Houston, Texas, and currently I'm the New York Executive Director of America Needs You. We're an organization that fights for the economic mobility of first-generation college students. Um, anyone in the room that your parents has, uh, neither one of your parents have a college degree, you're a first-generation college student just like me. And um, we do that in two ways, through intensive career development, development and mentoring. Um, how are we changing the world? Uh, in the United States of America, 11% of first generation college students graduate from college in six years. 11%. Let that sit for a second. 
way we're changing the world through our program, 94% uh, of our students complete um, graduate from college in six years, um, and 92% of them are employed in the companies of their choice within six months of graduation or enrolled in graduate school full time. Um, we have a two-year program where our students can earn up to $2,000 in professional development grants, and we help them get internships by partnering with organizations such as Macquarie, um, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and other uh, amazing companies in the city. And so if any of you are going to a CUNY school, uh, in uh, for uh, college, would love to work with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gary Alker Jr. I'm an IT fellow at New York Presbyterian, which is a, a very big hospital here in the city, and also you know all the way around the world. We do many great things for you know the community as far as health wise. We put you know an, an array of you know money into giving health care to people that are all around the country, upwards to a billion dollars. And we also take on, you know, the hardest and most complicated health problems that are going around nationally. We'll take on patients from many different states. People come here from all around the world just to get specific procedures. And myself, I'm in a full-time fellowship program that's for recent graduates, and I attended Morehouse College, which was a great experience for me. And I'm very glad to be here and talk to you guys and maybe uh, connect as one of the youngest panel men members up here today. It's still morning, so good morning. My name is Alfred Ojuku. You can tell by the last name that I have some sort of foreign roots. Hopefully some of you guys can relate. I was originally born in Nigeria and I moved to Hawaii. So I grew up in Hawaii. Uh, then somehow I ended up in New York, right? So. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I work for Microsoft. I am a what they call a technology solutions. I have Invisalign, so it's going to sound funny. Technology solutions professional, which is essentially helping customers adopt solutions like the Surface, uh, you know, newer devices that really you know help them get more things done. Um, one of the reasons why I feel Microsoft is making a difference in the world and my company itself is really because you know one of the goals we have, one of the mission statements statements we have is to empower every person, and every student, every person on the planet to achieve more with the technology. And what we've done in the last five to 10 years, you've seen us essentially partnering with so many different, you know, folks like Google and, you know, healthcare companies to make sure that we're, we're focusing on the humanitarian aspects of using technology. In other words, technology almost sort of fades in the background, but it actually still lets you get things done. Uh, how many people do not have a cell phone right now? Exactly. Yeah. So growing up, none of us had a cell phone. Barely, we had what flip phones and all that. So I, I hopefully today we'll get a chance to kind of talk about what that looks like, um, and how you know as a partnership we can show you how to get into the STEM space and actually you know opportunities to to move into a careers in STEM. Thank you. Awesome. So I first want to kick it off you know, by asking a question about how technology has an influence on your job. You know, they say that 77% of future jobs will require some sort of STEM skills. So when it comes to whether technology or coding, uh, even if you're not a coder yourself, how does technology um, play a role or, or problem solving skills play a role in your, in your job and industry? If anyone wants. Oh, and before we answer the questions, uh, I forgot to mention kind of the ground rules for the panel. Each reply is gonna be 90 seconds to two minutes. Uh, when we get to the speed round, 60 seconds. If I do hop over to another person and say, hey, I wanna hear Gary's opinion on that. It's not because I don't love you know, Peter or anything like that. It's because I wanna keep the flow and make sure you guys get a chance to get your questions in. Are you good with those rules, Emily? Awesome, cool. All right, so how does technology or coding play a role in your job? How does it have an impact? I'll jump in there. Uh, so every day I walk in with customers. I work specifically in healthcare. So uh, J and J, Pfizer, Merck, some of these companies, Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Some of you may have heard. We're helping them use these technologies to save lives. In other words, being able to determine whether someone's going to have a stroke, being able to monitor a baby's heart from home and determine whether or not they have some sort of arrhythmia. Um, so, and and just being able to take take advantage of it today. That is where we see not just there, but we're seeing that technology is essentially is intended to help, you know, get things done quicker. Prior to that, we probably couldn't do that. We had to 
I mean, without technology, what would we do with all this technology? You know, how would we help people you know, save lives? So I really feel like saving lives is a big part of this, as well as being able to get more things done with you know less tools. Yeah. So I've had the opportunity to work in the tech industry for over ten years, right? And the beautiful, beautiful thing about tech is that no matter what industry you go to, there's a job for you, right? Um, so I've worked in retail. I've worked for Coach, Ma Coach um, the handbag store, right? I've worked for New York Magazine. I've worked for the Department of Education. I worked in financial services. Mm. Any job, any industry you think of, there's going to be a job. And tech, you know, oftentimes people hear about tech, they think about someone sitting behind a computer, they're coding. Tech is so much more than that. There is hardware, there is software, there is networking, there is cybersecurity, there is artificial intelligence. The, the, there's like so many areas you can go into. And so when you think about tech, think about like other interests that, um, that you, you like, you know, because it, it definitely converges with so many other industries. Yeah, for me, uh, in the nonprofit sector, I think tech is really important when you're thinking about um, reporting um, data. We get a lot of data, and in order to fundraise, we have to uh, show our uh, the people who fund us that we're meeting our outcomes. Not only us, my, our nonprofit, all nonprofits. And so having individuals who are adept at using Excel, crunching data is extremely important. We also use uh, a client um, client management software called Salesforce. So being able to use that and and because tech is only good as good as the person who manages it and programs it. And so having individuals who not do that is really important. Um, specifically, also for me as a organization that is about career development, um, introducing students to tech to. Um, to Peter's point, I think that a lot of students, a lot of people, just don't know what there is to do in the tech industry. And I think. Um, as, as my organization, I think it's really important for us to show our students what's possible and to provide them access to the individuals and these companies so that they can learn um, more about the positions that are available there because you don't necessarily have to be a mathematician to work in a tech company. My wife works at Twitter and she sells ad space um, for, to Pepsi. Like that is her job. And so there are a lot of ways you can get in there and this industry is booming and it's, on, it's only gonna go get bigger. And it's super important that uh, young people as yourselves, uh, kind of we kind of break down that third wall um, of tech so that you understand how you can um, become, uh, have careers there, even if you're not interested in coding or other things in, of that nature. Yes, I just wanted to piggyback on that because so I am uh, an attorney without a, a tech background. So my undergraduate major, for example, was in an international business, uh, and then I, you know, worked for a while and then went to law school. Um, and sort of, you know, the way tech is everything that I do every day now um, in terms of advising my clients on, um, you know, how to how they sort of get their product to market, um, what uh, terms they should have with customers, protections. We consider data all the all the time, sort of ownership rights over data. Data, privacy related to data, um, and uh, you know, so those are things that we consider. Uh, we also sort of see on top of evolving technologies, blockchain technology, uh, artificial intelligence, etc., uh, and sort of understanding how those will impact the world and also impact the legal profession um, for those who are who are um, interested in passing the law. Um, the the practice of law may look substantially different, um, you know, five, ten years from now, um, particularly for junior lawyers than what it does today or what it did look like a few years ago when I first started. That's awesome. Yeah. I know here for uh, New York Presbyterian, we have, you know, over 40,000 employees and 10 hospital locations. And with that being said, the access has to be always up and available for our employees. But even more importantly, we have to support the clinical application systems, which are the, you know, EMR systems that have all your health information in them, that give the vitals to the doctors, that can tell them what medical um, devices may be needed, you know, what medicine you're on. And these applications are very complex and the access is always needed because it's for the better patient outcome. So our job, you know, is really important to making sure that these applications are up and also that they're secure and that your information is secure. Awesome. So let's imagine for a second, I'm one of these students in the crowd. Let's, let's imagine I'm like a mod back there with the cool blue jacket, right? And I'm hearing this and I'm like, you know what? I want to get involved in tech. I don't know where to start. 
What do I do? How do I start to get the skills? What are some practical steps that I can get now to kind of start building that framework and that groundwork so that when I do get to college, when I do get to a point where I'm here with a resume that people can take me seriously? Well, I guess I start that, I say that, you know, tech is an industry that often changes and whatnot, but I guess as a, you know, as a kid at your age or, you know, a young adult, three things that, you know, won't change will would be working hard, working well with others, and continuing to want to learn more. So, you know, at your age, make sure you stay consistent with your grades and give yourself, you know, the opportunity to do greater things in the future and also take advantage of resources that you may have. You know, I don't I know most of us up here in this panel probably didn't have opportunity to come to events like this at your age. And, you know, there wasn't many around, you know, to influence the youth to have access to technology. So take advantage of, you know, all the resources you have and also just, you know, take advantage of those, you know, three keys, working hard wanting to learn more and work well with others. There's this old saying that goes, I'm Southern by the way, and my, I grew up with my grandmother and she used to always say these things. Um, she said, closed mouths don't get fed, right? Um, you're born ready, stay ready. So you'll never know what kind of opportunity you can have, you'll never know who you can meet. And what I mean by that, um, sometimes we, when we're in different spaces, we, we're not ready, we're not on. You're always on because you never know who you can meet. So when you meet someone, you need to be able to go, and we're gonna go over this in my session, you need to be able to go to them, be able to introduce yourself, tell them who you are, where you're going to school, or what you're interested in, and just ask them, can we? Can I follow with you? Can I get your email address to, to keep into contact with you? Um, those, number one, people are gonna respect you for doing that because it's not easy to, just to go up to someone, start a conversation and network with them and ask them, can I, can I learn more about what you do? Um, and then as you do that, uh, you can build relationships with people and that can parlay into meeting other people. Um, think about your teachers, ask your teachers if they know anyone in the tech industry, maybe your guidance counselors or uh, people in your school, they may have friends or someone that they're willing to open up the networks to. It's um, one thing I've learned out learned about in life, I was I was pretty smart, but I, I had, there are a lot of people who had better GPAs than I did, did more prestigious fellowships and all these things. But it's not always about what you know; it's about who you know, mm. and not only about who you know, but it's how you treat people. To uh, what Gary just said, one of the biggest lessons that I can give anybody, no matter what career you're interested in, no matter what you want to do in life, people matter. So listen. People don't listen anymore because of cell phones and technology. People don't really listen anymore. So when you can get somebody and you're with them one-on-one, -on -one, authentically listen to them, and that will have an impact on them. And because you're doing that, that's going to set you apart from other people that they're meeting. Awesome. Your goal is to uh, – you might have 30 seconds. You want to make somebody for, remember you and not forget you in the 30 seconds that you have with them. Awesome. Can I tell a short story? Yeah, Peter, go for it. Um, so plus one to that. I would also add is – who you know will, will, will get you in the door, mm -hmm. but what you know will keep you there, right? And that's the big difference. Um, but when I was in high school, right? I'm sure everyone here is in high school, right? Um, Except I, for the adults. I know. <laughs> we, we were in high school at one point. <laughs> okay. But I didn't take my education seriously. I was a C student at best. You know, I went to school. I hated all my classes. The only class I really liked was math. Don't judge me. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, you know, I was in school just trying to, sorry, that's my chopstick, um, in school just not taking my education seriously, but my principal came to me um, in one of my electrical engineering class. I went to Thomas Edison High School in Queens. It's a vocational technical school. And he said, hey, you know, there's a company called Cisco. Um, they have a program called the Cisco Networking Academy, and we want to pilot it at this school. And I said, nah, I'm, I'm not, mm -mm, I don't want no parts of that. And I went home, I told my mom, and she was like, oh, you're going to do that program. <laughs> you are going to do that program. And I'm so happy she did that for me, because I went back to school, I participated, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. You know, I didn't know what it was, but I just shut it off immediately. But having the opportunity to be exposed to it, at least trying it out, I realized it was something that I actually liked. Um, so there are going to be folks that are going to come in your life, and they're going to present these opportunities to, for you. You're probably going to see flyers on the walls in your school, and you're going to be like, eh, I want to hang out with my friends. Take advantage. At least try it out. And that's how you get to start to understand what you don't like and what you do like. And I'll just add something there, just to tie back into what, is, what he said earlier. Closed mouths don't get fed. Period. Bars. <laughs> Be curious. 
be passionate, find the thing that you enjoy, ask questions. It's what's going to get you moving forward and getting into the next level. That's really what it was. I can tell you right now, every single one of us, at some point in our career, we're sitting where you guys were. We were asking the same question, like, how did they get up there, right? And part of it is we just were determined to make a difference. We were not were not going to just settle with graduating high school, right? We were going to try to figure it out. So all of you guys have that opportunity to be curious, to be passionate, to find something that you like and then make money doing it. Awesome. A couple quick resources for you guys, especially the note takers. Um, code.org, they have an hour of code, but if you put code.org backslash Star Wars, you can build like a Star Wars game in an hour. You could be like, I made a game. So it's good to have a portfolio. Another good thing is for those who are by Brooklyn, the NYU uh, Tandon School of Engineering, they have a gaming innovation lab on Thursdays from, I think it's six to eight. They, you basically go there, you test people's games that they've coded themselves, they give you a token, you trade it in for pizza. So you get to basically test video games and get pizza. So there's all these different ways. Where, where is this again? <laughs> I know, right? It's like, I'm hungry. Um, so all these, because I, I run a Best Buy Teen Tech Center, and all of our students, you know, without coding backgrounds, are like, well, how do I start? So there's these little things. And the third thing is, if for uh, definitely write this down, Scratch. Um, no, no, no. I'm a, no, no, no. I'm going to blow your mind, though. I'm going to blow your mind. I'm going to blow your mind. Go on Scratch and put in the top three video games on Scratch. There's a Star Wars game, and there's one that's like a Mario ripoff, right? Then YouTube how to remix a game. So instead of trying to build a game, because it gets frustrating, remix a game is like kind of like taking apart you know, an iPhone. You figure out how it works way better by taking apart than try building it. I think most people approach it like, you got to build it, and you're like, what do I do next? Play like one of the you know the top most played games, and then uh, build remix it. Wait, wait, I have a question. Why did everybody boo or you know sigh? Y'all didn't like it. Oh wait, no, no, no. Let's. I love that question. So wait, wait. Would you mind sharing why you didn't like it? I thought it was a real honest answer. Uh, the projects had nothing to do with the test, so it was just kind of really <laughs> Did the projects feel relevant to your life, though? So here's, for example, like, so uh, I'll give you an example. Like, we did a project at, at, at uh, our, our, um, our center where kids build a self-esteem anti-bullying app, and it was in the voice of Cardi B. So every time, like, you felt bad, it's like, you got this, so, you know what I mean? Like, so then people were like, I want to do that. That's cool. My friends can download my app. So I think... You know, when you start to look at how these things can be relevant to your life, they start to be a little bit more fun. All right, so we're going to get into the speed round. You guys ready for the speed round? Okay, I'm going to throw a question, 30 seconds or less, answer. Okay, go. First question, what is one app that you're a little bit guilty that you've binged on? I will start with mine. It's Temple Run. Cuphead. YouTube. 2048. Instagram. Mm. Definitely Instagram. <laughs> Okay, 30 seconds are left. Who is one person growing up in your life that you can look to and say, man, because this person was in my life, it helped push me towards that trajectory? Who is that person? Give a little bit about them. I'll go first. I'll say my mother. My mother uh, was big on education. Uh, she got multiple degrees and whatnot. And, you know, my father was more into sports, but my mom stayed steady and always was in my ear about school and made me put that, you know, first um, for me, it was my grandmother, Rosa. Uh, she was born in 1932 in Tyler, Texas. Didn't go to school past the third grade, but, um, like, she is the single, like, I grew up under her, and she taught me the work ethic, value, what it means to achieve things, and I literally wouldn't be sitting here without her. Yeah, I have to say my grandmother as well. Um, I, um, I'm a first generation. My grandmother, uh, my family came from Jamaica, the West Indies. Um, my grandmother migrated here at the age of like 45 and literally had to start her career all over. And today she is a homeowner. She, is a, she has her bachelor's degree in education. She helped put me through school. Um, she's just really been inspirational for me. That's awesome. 
Uh, yeah, so definitely my, my mother. Um, so I was born to um, a teenage mother uh, who sort of raised me on her own. She didn't go to college. My dad didn't go to college, so I'm also first generation. And sort of just seeing her hard work and determination sort of get us, you know, get us by, um, got me to a good high school, um, you know, got me off to college, et cetera. Sort of seeing her do that all on her own and at such, at such a young age really sort of inspired me to, you know, push us us forward so not just myself but sort of my whole family forward and i would have to say my father my father he migrated from nigeria to hawaii brought us here we're like what are you doing like you know we loved our life and um he pushed us to to go to college to get involved with sports to make sure that we're being the best people you know i have seven brothers and sisters so i come from a big family mm. um and so it, it, you know like telling your dad you can't was not an option Right, but I did it all the time. So, um, but it got me where I'm at now. My dad passed about five years ago, mm. but he's still with me. So, that's awesome. All right, guys. So we're gonna open up to you guys. So this is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna scan the room. Just raise your hand, and I'm gonna throw this guy out. So <laughs> this is your opportunity to ask questions if you wanna know. Yes, we have one back here. Raise your hand first. So I'm gonna throw this to you. Oh, don't throw it. Yes. So wait, he raised his hand first. So and then. You can go after. <laughs> this is Mike. It is a Mike. Oh. Uh, with the talk of uh, cryptocurrency, how are you getting like students involved and more and more with your company involved with cryptocurrency? So I'm gonna say proceed with caution. <laughs> really, it's it's a great technology. You know, it has a lot of um, real benefits that people can see, but the idea that if you're gonna invest in it, you gotta go into it you know, all in. You can't go halfway in. Um, I, I dabbled in it at one point. I have friends that have full in and they're doing well. But it's a market that is changing how we manage currency. However, it, you have to do it in a way that allows you to be, I guess, you know, focused on you know, the profits of the future and really just paying attention to it. It, it, is a, is it a time drag, but everybody's different, right? Some people like that sort of thing. Um, so you just have to find what makes sense for you uh, just don't do it if it doesn't make sense, but do it if you like it. Awesome. Yes, uh, the young that you had raised your hand first. Um, so I wanted to ask, what was your majors in college to see, like, how did you end up here from college or high school? Because not everybody think they want to be in STEM or coding, like, that's not. Yeah. Um, I can answer that because I've had like six different jobs. Um, I st when I was in your age, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, my degree is actually in biology. Um, I did this thing called Teach for America, and I was a teacher for a few years. Then I worked for Teach for America, which is a nonprofit. Then I became a assistant principal for five years. I've also ran for office. I've worked on political campaigns. I've done organizing work. Um, I have, um, yeah, and now I'm, I work, I've, yeah, now I'm an ED of a nonprofit. So I've done a lot of different things. What I'll say is um, the thing that's guided me to where I am is like, I, I deeply believe that education is a civil rights issue of our time. That's, that's my North Star. And so I want to be in work that where I can contribute to that space. And so think about what your North Star is and that will help guide your career. I know myself, I didn't see myself originally going into IT, but in college, you know, I majored in business administration and always saw myself in the area of marketing or consulting and whatnot. Um, but technology was always something in my life. I knew it was relevant. And uh, to be in the IT program I'm in, uh, you know, I've seen you don't have to have multiple, you know, certifications and whatnot and very extreme technical skills to be a part of IT. There is that aspect of it, but it's more so of, you know, the workflow and the steps that it takes, like he said, you know, spin around, you know, do the dance, but when, in what order, you know, you can do that in a bigger scale of a business. And, you know, when are we going to implement this? When are we going to move on from this system and whatnot? And there's multiple aspects of IT um, that you can be involved in. Yeah, for sure. So I got introduced to tech in high school, right? So, um, but that was on the networking side. Does anyone know what networking is? The networking side of tech? So it's basically, you have your computer labs in school, right? And there are computers in the labs. Um, so the program that I did in high school taught me how to build and repair computers. And then it taught me how to build and repair networks of computers. Like how do you connect those computers together? Um, but in order for me to connect those computers together, I had to learn how to code. Um, and the reason why I learned how to code is because there was a lot of 
things that I had to do repeatedly. And if I learned how to code, I could have my program, a programming language do that for me. So I didn't have to do it all the time. And so that piece of it got me interested. And so when I decided to go off to, to college, I majored in computer programming. And I went to a state university in um, Long Island. Now remember, I was a C student. And so when it was time for me to go off to college, there wasn't that many options for me, right? Um, because you know, because of my grades. Um, so I decided to go to a state university because I wanted to get away from my mom and I just wanted to live on campus. That's a whole nother story. Um, but I went there and when, once I got there, I decided to make the best of that opportunity and it ended up with like a 3.7 GPA. So fast forward, I left um, SUNY Farmingdale and I ended up pursuing my master's in information systems as well. So I was the guy in, in, in college that Everybody, I was the only person that had a computer in my dorm. So all of the basketball, all the athletes would come to my room so I could actually help them write their paper. Right? So I was the guy that was writing up their paper, correcting them. Now you, you can't use, you know, that. You have to use this or something like that. And that, I spent my time focused on that. But my, my major was business administration, just like him. Um, and, you know, I was going to work for the government. I had a full scholarship at the time. The difference was, once I got done with school, because of the full scholarships, they said, you can go into any field you want to. But because I'd spent so much time on the computer, I was like, I want to be on the IT team. So I went to school for public policy and administration, but I ended up on the IT team and fell in love with IT. Yeah. So you don't, that goes to show that you don't have to necessarily come into uh, the role as a technician. You just have to have the passion for it. Awesome. So let's see if we have anyone else. Yes, over here. I've been instructed not to throw it. I'm very tempted to, but I will follow. Um, what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome in order to be where you are right now? It's a great question. Yeah. There are so many challenges you're going to face. You know, it's just nonstop. I think once you get into tech, you have to develop this this level of persistence, right? You know, and just and and a level of knowing where to go for help. Um, challenges don't stop. I've had challenges in high school. I'm not working as a diversity manager, and I'm still experiencing challenges. It's just that's just the part of life. Um, I think the most the most challenging thing, if I was at your age, um, I think once I got to to college. Um, you don't see a lot of black and brown folks in this industry, right, in computer science and tech. And so I came from a community where I always saw folks that looked like me. I went to school with folks that looked like me in the library, church, and then I get to college and I'm surrounded by folks that don't know about jerk chicken and, you know, like stuff that I'm, that, like my culture. And so that cultural difference was a bit of a challenge, like making friends and getting to understand different cultures, that was a bit of a challenge for me. I think that something, this is, I don't know if you've all have ever heard of imposter syndrome. This is like this this feeling where you question whether whether you belong in a space. And that's something that I've like battled throughout. I was just at this, I'm in a part of this leadership circle for executive directors. There's like 40 people in the room. I'm the youngest person, I'm the only black man in the room, right? And so honestly, I don't feel psychologically safe in this space. But I also have to show up knowing that if I don't show up right now, then the next person who looks like me will come after me, then they're not gonna be as accepted in the space. And that's just the way I have to deal with it. And I, I walk into a room, do I have any basketball fans in the room? Right, great. So I went to Howard. Howard is a beautiful space. Um, I attended predominantly black schools my entire life, but I didn't appreciate being a black person until I went to Howard. And because of that, Howard gave me irrational confidence. When Kobe Bryant shot his shots, he shot it with this irrational confidence, no matter what is going to go in. That's what Kyrie did last night. Kyrie was shooting shots with irrational confidence. And like when I walk in the room, I have this irrational confidence, and no matter what shot I shoot, it's going to go in. And that's and no matter what space I'm in, that's how I feel. And that's what you need to do whatever space you step in. Hashtag shoot your shot. <laughs> did Boston win last night? Yeah, oh, they did. Okay, great. Nice. Okay, all right, cool. Um, we have someone over there? No. No, okay. Yes, Lucas. All right. We got Joyner Lucas over here. I'm just joking. There you go. Um, how much money do you guys make? <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
I'm gonna translate that question. No, no, no. I I'm got gonna it. translate I got that it. question. Okay. So, no, I don't. That's I. So your intent is to understand like, is it a profitable career to get a tech? So I think the 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 way to approach that is, what is the salary range of if you're starting out in you know technology or or, or your industry? What is the salary range? I, it's not so. The, this is a no, guys. This is a teachable moment, and I think it's important not to judge people when they ask a question because I wouldn't know. You're in eleventh grade. I wouldn't know in 11th grade what questions to ask or not to ask, right? So normally when you meet a professional, asking them how much they specifically make yeah. is normally uh, something that you wouldn't do in a professional setting. But it is okay to ask, hey, I'm curious about how to get into information systems or to work in AI. What's the salary range for that type of, should I invest my time in that? That's a different way to phrase it and get the same information. Does that work? Without having people look at you with a side eye, right? <laughs> all right, so, all right, so who wants to talk about salary ranges? Um. Okay, so I could start. <laughs> um, so I work in a, in a major law firm, um, and a lot of the sort of major law firms in, I guess, throughout the country have sort of bench, <laughs> benchmark salaries. They sort of, they range, but, um, and just to explain the background to getting into the law, um, so you go to undergrad, some people take time off between undergrad and law school, maybe work a different job. Some people go straight to law school. You do law school for three years, um, oftentimes incur a significant amount of debt to get through law school. Um, and then you can do any range of things. Um, but for what I do, I think starting salary is, I don't know, they I think they recently changed it, but it's I think around 180,000, something like that. Uh, that's actually, Good response. Um, so he's absolutely right. You never go into a business asking somebody how much money to make, right? If you're interested, you do the research, you look up salary ranges against specific positions. And the funny part is it'll always change per organization, per user, or not per user, per, per individual, depending on what they're interested in. Um, what's more important is what do they do and how valuable is it to the company? But just to kind of give you context, right? So when I first started working, and again, it depends on when you came into the workforce, I was making $12,000. Like that was, you know, and I thought that was a lot then. So my point is it's relative. Over the years, I've obviously doubled, even tripled, quadrupled that number, right? And it's really a, a matter of, you know, by the time I got out of high school, uh, sorry, college and grad school, it was uh, well well above 100,000, right? And that was the goal, you know? But it's always relative. It doesn't matter how much, much more money you make, you're gonna spend more, you're gonna have car notes, house notes. It's, it's all relative. So don't ever fall for that how much money do you make. Focus on what you're passionate about because that's what's gonna help you make that money. Yeah, I would say when I, and this is 20 years ago, right? So when I started off as an intern, um, I, my first internship was with the city of New York and I was making $25 an hour. And this was 20 years ago, right? So you can imagine like cost of living, what the starting for someone in the internship business would be for now. Um, I think as you, you um, go through your career, entry level and so on, as a software engineer and like other parts of tech, it ranges, it can be from 60 to 80, all the way up to $200,000, depending on your level of experience. And then when you're in areas of like emerging technology where they're where it's in demand, so like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, that's where the money is. So you want to focus on those areas. Can you say those two sectors again? <laughs> artificial intelligence, um, cybersecurity, yeah. um, data science. These are fields that are in high demand. So those are the areas you want to focus on at your, if you want to make some big bucks. So for those who didn't write it down, what are the three sectors you just mentioned? Artificial. Okay, can we just go in the same time? It's like it's like it's like a band that didn't practice. All right, what are the three areas? Artificial intelligence, security, and data science. Awesome, cool. You, you, can I just yeah. add something to that real quick? You know why that's important? Main reasons because essentially we've already explored so much about the basics of you know computers, technology, and identity that we're now down to looking at data and how much data changes both on pre, uh, you know, in your offices and as well as in the cloud. So if you have that capability to basically you know, look through and cipher information that's being you know, posted in some technology solution, that's when they start paying you. I mean, I know people that are at 300K, 400K, even 500K for what they do, but they work their butts off. 
Yeah. Yeah. In education, um, I'll talk. I started as a teacher, so I'll talk about that. You'll uh, make fifties, mid fifties, depending on the whether it's traditional public school or charter school. When I was a uh, dean of students, assistant principal, I was making around between eighties, nineties. Um, and then as uh, executive director, you make six figures, depending on the amount of experience. It can be high, low. Um, I knew principals, uh, principals at one of the charter school networks I made. They made uh, upwards of $150,000, not inclusive of bonuses. Um, so it just depends. Um, but to the point earlier, it's not about um, you make enough money for quality of life and to to build your future. But don't let that be your sole driving factor, because what you're going to do, you're going to find out that you're dead inside and you're unhappy and you're going to have like, <laughs> a crisis and you're going to want to change what you do. So, Jerome, I want to talk to you about that, because I've actually been a mentor for America Needs You. Yes. And I know in a lot of the sessions they talk about salary is a consideration, but sometimes it's not the most important. So what are some oh, of the considerations yeah. you tell students? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, so I'm going to be transparent with you. I quit my job in December, right? I was making decent money. I love my students. I love my school. I was getting up at 5.30, 5.30 a.m. I was at work by 6.30. I led every morning. I led the opening for our students, 380 students every morning. I led lunch and clubs throughout the day. I also coached three teachers. I was teaching... Two science, two science blocks. Literally from 7.15 to 4 o'clock, I had no time to myself. Mm. And then I couldn't, because I was doing all that stuff I just told you all about, I couldn't do any work during the day. I still had to grade, I had to grade papers for the classes I was teaching. I had to do review lesson plans. I had to give feedback on the systems that I owned. So I was frequently leaving work at 7 o'clock every night. And by the time I got home, I had nothing left. And so I decided that I, I needed to transition out. So now my hours are 10 to 6. I go to I get up every morning uh, around six. I'll meditate I, or I go to the gym, run, work out. Um, I have time to do things for myself. Um, and like the consideration there for me in making that life change was my my mental health, right? Mm. And like I needed my time back because time is valuable. The time is the most valuable thing you can you'll ever have because once it's gone, you can never get back. Money can't buy it. Right. So um, be protected of your time as you are selecting careers. Think about the benefits packages that they have. There are some companies, for example, I have a friend who works at Bleacher Report. He can get a membership at Equinox. Everybody, and you know what? Y'all know what Equinox Gym is? He can get a membership for $75. That gym membership is like $220, right? Um, my wife works at Twitter. They get free lunch and breakfast every day. And they have things to drink in the office. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, that matters to people. Um, that I, when we were, my wife worked at, uh, when she first got into the ad industry, she didn't make that much money. She made like 40 k a year. But she, got, she went to some of the most amazing restaurants in the city for free because Clients want to impress her. I used to go to Brooklyn Nets and Houston Rockets games and Yankees games for free and be in a suite. I went to I saw Kendrick Lamar's damn tour last year for free in a box because of her industry. So it's, hey. you can just think about the perks. Think about I know it's lit. Um, think about think about the perks. Think about what matters to you. Yeah. Think about the things you value as you're making those choices. Think about the benefits package. There's a lot of different. And, and I can add too, like um, just from my perspective, I work in a nonprofit and we we get paid in love. We get there we go. Uh, yeah, but I actually, <laughs> but I, but I actually have a, I have a consulting business. So I actually make more in my consulting business than I do in my in my day job. So you know, you got to think about like what's important to you. You know, is it how far it is to work, get to work? Like you said, is it the culture of the organization? You know, do you get to make your own rules and kind of do your own thing, or is it super structured? All those can play a factor. That's not just about the salary, you know, like like Lucas asked about. So we are at about 12.06. I want to be a responsible human adult. Um, we have, I would say we have about four minutes uh, to ask some more questions. And then I'm going to break out, we're going to break out into um, three different workshops you guys can choose and we can rotate. So uh, let's get some, yes, you have a question. Can you pass him the blue thing? Um, how do we like feel about surveillance capitalism? Like, like, like the idea that like when you search something in Google and like you open a site, there are like ads that are tailored to things that you've searched in the past. Like the idea of like companies selling our information to other people, just like that general idea. So wait, so I'm gonna. What's your name? Mahedi. Huh? Mahedi. So I know everyone kind of had that reaction. Like I'm guessing that maybe you asked thought-provoking questions a lot in school. No. <laughs> Yo, get a man his respect. Yo, give the man some, yo, put <laughs> some respect on his exactly. name. Put some respect. Listen, no, no, 
I want to tell you, well, guess what? I want to affirm you and celebrate you for that moment because that is an important question because I think that as we get more technologically advanced, ethics is very important. Yeah. So his question is about surveillance capitalism. You know, obviously last year there was a whole big thing with Facebook and privacy and, and, and the ads with the election. So these are things that people are thinking about. And I think that if we're going to be responsible and talk about tech, we should address the elephant in the room. So does anyone want to um, address that? Um, maybe from your personal opinion, maybe you can't speak on behalf of your organization, but does anyone want to, you know, talk about, do they think it's an issue? Do they think that things are being put in place? I am actually so proud you asked that question because I'm an, I'm an adjunct professor at um, Pace University downtown, and I, I have these conversations with college students. They're like, we don't care. We're still going on Facebook. We're still giving them all my information. I just like, so super proud that you're thinking about that at this age. And it's, it's definitely an issue, you know. There are a lot of companies, um, even Google, that have specific departments dedicated to that, thinking about how are we monetizing on the data that we're collecting. That's what data science is all about, mm -hmm. right? What do we do with that information? And their government, you know, politicians and agencies all over who are thinking about how can we create laws around that um, but the challenge is like technology moves so fast that the laws can't keep up right so we, we need folks like you who are interested in this space to take on those challenges and to to be the advocates for consumers in this space so super proud that you asked that question to build on that point um, does anybody know what a lobbyist is okay do you know how much money lobbyists make Okay, so because to Peter's point, policy, and you all know this, especially my law people, it moves at a at a tor like a snail's pace, especially at the federal government level, which is where these laws are going to be made. And so tech is going to move so much faster. There's so much technology coming. When we think about Alexa and it's always listening, and like how how the like Alexa is being used in court cases to get people off. Like there's a lot of implications with this. And so we just don't have the laws to do that. So there's going to be a lot of money um, in the legal field, in the political field, lobbying Congress on these things. I think that's a, like five to – even now, it's going to be a huge industry because, the, law, the quite frankly, lawmakers don't understand it. And so they're going to need people on their teams, number one, who can explain it to them. They're going to need people who can actually write these laws for them. And so that's going to be – if you can marry both law, your experience with law, policy, and tech, data science, all those things, I think you're going to be a powerhouse, to say the least. Well, I guess to answer your question from at least our perspective at my company in healthcare, um, you know, AI and big data, you know, it can be extremely helpful for us. You know, we can see patient outcomes, you know, and use those to tailor it towards someone else's care and try to, you know, minimize risk. But at the same time, you know, many companies and whatnot reach out to us and offer to buy data data from us to help get their company started and whatnot, and it's large amounts, but we have to be conscious of that data traveling. And many times we turn down, you know, those offers because, you know, we want to have a good reputation and keep, you know, keep afloat and don't want to have, you know, be in the news for something drastic like that that could cause someone's, you know, personal information to get out there. No one wants that. Um, also, if you guys get a chance, just Google, like, top 10 tips for cybersecurity because it's so easy. Like, little random things like uh, sometimes putting your birthday in your Facebook um, or, or geo tagging. Oh, I'm at the mall right now. People have been using that to steal people's identities. So there's guides online. You can find like, you know, little common hacks for passwords and certain things not to put in your profile. Cause there's things that are like, oh, this doesn't seem like a big deal. It's just my birthday or it's just like I'm at the mall. But those are kind of the data points that people use to hack into people's security. So it's important to understand how to be a responsible digital citizen. So we're going to wrap up in about a, a uh, one, we have a question back there. Yes. Oh, yeah, I got you. You know what? I'm gonna. Oh, wait, does she want the thing? Oh, thanks. Oh. Um, so you know how you said that with the closed mouths, like you don't get fed. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. But how do you get your voice out there? <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead. Just like you did just now. Ask the question. That's it. Just stand up. Make sure make sure your voice is heard. That's it. It, it it's part of quieting that thing that says my 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 what I need to share isn't important and saying I need to share that information with the people that need to hear it. Um, we'll go over this in my session, but one thing I think is practice. Um, everybody, raise your hand if you actually like to public speak. Great, that's like 10% of the room. Like most people don't enjoy public speaking, and so 
public speaking, some people are naturally good at it, but it's something that can be taught and l- learned to be good at. So practice it. Um, practice introducing yourself with your friends, with your teachers or people you trust. Um, and then just take a chance. Like they're going to be, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay, so we're about to, we have a couple seconds left. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not going to have time to, we have a couple seconds left. Um, but panelists will be around for a couple seconds after if you have have a question. Um, we're going to bring up some of the vendors to talk about what they're, what, you know, what they have outside, because we're going to break into uh, sessions where you're either going to be going to the vendor fair or there's going to be a pre-selected workshop for you. Before we go, um, puppies, babies, or kitten videos, if you have to choose, go. Don't think about it. Gut reaction. Puppies. Puppies. Babies. 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 Puppies. Puppies. <laughs> Got it. I'm pretty sure there's a video out there with puppies, babies, and a kitten. Google it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so um, since well, since we uh, we just wrapped up the, since we just wrapped up the technology panel, I just wanted to uh, share what my favorite technology is. I found out about this a week ago in San Diego. There's a thing called King Spray where you basically put on a virtual reality headset and you can basically virtually spray paint any wall. So you can go on a wall in the city, and if someone has the app, they can see what you basically spray painted. So the future is here, y'all. <laughs> the future is here. All right, so. Round of applause for our panelists, please. If you guys, um, there's some orders underneath for you. You guys um, uh, may uh, go to your seat. Future is here. You can create it. Can we please have our vendors come up, share um, about 25 seconds or so about who you are, what you got going on? Very important. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Amina So. I am a Howard alum. I graduated in 2010 with a degree. HU, you know? <laughs> it's one of my classmates, graduated class of 2010. Um, I was a finance major at Howard University, and we are out in the hallway to share knowledge about Howard, the different programs that we offer. Howard is a world-class institution of higher learning located in Washington, D.C., and we look um, look forward to speaking with you all. And this is actually my roommate who I also graduated with in 2010 and she can speak a little bit more. Hello everybody, my name is Maya Cyrus. Again, I'm a Howard University graduate as well. Maya Cyrus. I was a mathematics major at Howard. Um, so definitely step outside. I would love to talk to you all about the STEM experience at Howard. We have many, many uh, graduate programs in engineering. Uh, we have a law school, medical school, dental school, divinity school. We have, we have it all at Howard. So please come out and talk to us. Right on. Good morning. Ni hao, bonjour. What's up? My name is Andrew, and I am a Morehouse alum from 2006. Uh, very happy to be here to be talking actually about what my company does. We are Brain Gain Global, and we operate the largest magazine in the world for international study. I am here today to talk about two summer programs that I'm offering. Number one, Arizona State University program in STEM, AI, and technology for two weeks out in Phoenix. And then the other one is a finance program at the Wharton School of Business in Philadelphia. I'm in the back corner. I look forward to speaking with you and wish you a continued successful rest of your year. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Maria Leal. I'm from St. Francis College. I'm a current sophomore there studying psychology and double minoring in Spanish and women and gender studies. Um, we're a local school in Brooklyn Heights and we have over 50, uh, 70 programs for undergrads and several uh, graduate programs. So for those of you who are looking for a local and affordable option, we're definitely the place for you guys to come and talk to. Hi guys, my name is Bernard and I'm a PhD candidate at City University of New York for Cognitive Neuroscience. So if you want to come and talk to me about a radiology technology, any of the engineering, artificial intelligence, or even machine learning, please come and see me. I'll be right here at the back. Hi everyone, my name is Mikhail. This is Preeti. Hello. We're both from NYU Admissions. We're at the purple tablecloth right outside. Come talk to us about the different locations. Yeah, NYU, woo! <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's it. You all love it already, so there's not much more to say. No, uh, tons of locations to study, tons of programs to choose from, including our Tandon School of Engineering uh, in Brooklyn's Tech Triangle, but 10 schools and colleges across the New York City campuses and degree-granting campuses in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. Feel free to come ask us questions and just talk about how cool NYU is. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I'm Wow, look at you all. I'm Craig Broccoli with Binghamton University. Go Bearcats! 
Bert and I went to school together. This was an old mentor of mine. It's part of the reason why I'm even up on this stage. So I studied engineering and then business at Binghamton. Many of you already know Binghamton, you know, being the number one public in New York helps, right? But a lot of you need to dive a bit deeper on the areas you want to study. Those panelists gave you some inspiration. So certainly the table on the outside with the B on the, on the table. So we could dive a little bit deeper about what Binghamton has to offer. Six different colleges, 130 majors, three hours from here. So it's away from the city, but very well connected to the city. So we'll go deeper into that. Hello, I'm Tony Robinson with Digital Girl Inc. Um, that's an organization that promotes STEM uh, disciplines in careers as well as education. And I'm a Brooklyn Tech alum. Where's my Tech Nights? <laughs> okay. And um, a software engineer by trade. I work with IBM as well as uh, continuing my work with Digital Girl Inc. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Gall. I'm the founder and executive director of Digital Girl Inc., also a Brooklyn Tech alumni. So, <laughs> gotta give it up for us. Um, we're everywhere. Um, and we're going to be giving out some information about STEM fields, um, the power of STEM, especially for people of color and girls, and also giving you an opportunity to do some coding. So stop by, we're right outside this right door. Hi, I'm Danielle, and I am from New York Presbyterian Hospital. I am also here with my colleague, Bill Sloan. We are also located outside. We offer internships, and we also have fellowships for students that are in college and in high school. So we are here to offer information about our institution. Thanks. I also say we work in the recruiting department at NYP, so any questions about interviewing, resumes, salaries, that type of stuff, feel free to come up and talk to us. So wait, when I hear uh, fellowship and internship, I think friendship, because yeah. if you're high school, you need to be friends with these guys. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you guys already know me. I actually run the Blacks at Microsoft program. Uh, we do a lot of programs for youth. Uh, we had a program on March 15th focused on showing opportunities to, to do coding, to connect with other internship opportunities as well as mentorship programs. So we have a session in here that's coding and also you know how to use office tools as well. So make sure that you're talking to those folks. They have tours at the Microsoft store as well to kind of you know figure out how to do different games and HoloLens of that, of that nature. So I just want to make sure that you guys know that they're, that they're there and just excited to have you guys here. Can I just take a selfie with all the vendors, if we can just get in there? All right, my arm's not long enough. I'm going to do my best. Uh, all right, cool. We did our best.